the end, I will do a section on brands and brand symbols, and that, this actually ties in because it's one of the points, um, these are Adbusters posters, and what they're trying to do is to take popular symbols or brands and rework them. So kind of like this question with the swastika, can you re rework a symbol, can you make it something different? Um, so I think in, in presenting your symbols, so obviously symbols can have different meanings. You could have a personal meaning for a symbol, you could have a political meaning. Um, they can mean one thing to an individual, as we talked about with the swastika, they can mean another thing to a society. And it just raises questions then about how do symbols get used and how do we have debates about their use. Now I'll talk about, in fact, it reminds me I should pass out this handout, which um, you can follow along and it gives you one. Okay, so um, anthropologists, obviously, when anthropologists study symbols, they're going to take into account all this stuff you talked about as far as the different meanings, the personal meanings, the political meanings, uh, social meanings. One of the key points about symbols is that in the anthropological sense, they get used in social contexts. And obviously in rituals, it's really key. In a ritualistic context, the symbols in some ways express even more of the meaning of the spiritual system, the religious system, because of the powerful connotations that symbols have. Um, so, you know, I have this, and a lot of this is on your handout, so you don't have to write this down necessarily, but Paul Tillich, you know, talks about the symbol always points beyond itself. I think this is the key with the swastika, really all the symbols you presented today, but particularly symbols that incite us or get us thinking about something maybe in an emotional sense, that takes us beyond the symbol itself. And we'll talk about in a second uh, the work of Charles Hockett, a famous linguist, a famous linguist who talked about symbolic principles of language. And one of the points about a symbol or any kind of complex language that humans use is that it can refer to something outside of the time and space that you're talking about. We call that displacement, where I can talk about something, you, know, you mentioned the Holocaust or you mentioned World War II, we don't have to travel in time to those events and those places or even see images. We have notions in our heads about what that means, and that's called displacement, the fact that a symbol can t take us through time and space and travel to there without actually physically you know, teleporting to that place or, or traveling in time. So it's always pointing to something beyond itself, and I think that is a real key for understanding symbols. Um, you know, Anywhere you look in the world, in the world of emoticons and now emojis, I think uh, with Facebook, uh, they're talking about moving beyond just the like button to where you can, uh, do they have this already yet if you use Facebook? Where you can basically have a smiley face or a, a frowny face or something like this, which um, shows you the power of symbols, right? The fact that you can express something very quickly. If you just write, um, you know, LOL, laugh out loud when you're typing an email message, it's the same thing, right? You're communicating something and presumably someone else knows what you're communicating. And we can then begin to group um, different types of, of symbols together, and those then should further show us how the world is organized conceptually, symbolically. Um, for any, you know, if you're working with transistors, right, those are going to have specific symbols. If you're an architect, those have particular symbols. In a lot of these cases, um, they might be very functional. So, like, if we're talking about transistors and diodes and stuff like this, um, it's not going to have a political context. So, the political context, when that comes in, that gets really interesting, as both of you mentioned with, with the swastika today. And again, just the different world is going to have um, different subsets here. Uh, uh, prefectures in Japan will have particular symbols and those mean things. And then, like, you know, if you're a traveler off of going to a new place, you get into the issue of, you know, needing to know those symbols in some cases for very practical reasons, personal safety or which side of the road to drive on. Anytime you drive um, in a new place, and I, I noticed in the GPS units, we were traveling this um, summer in Italy and Austria and Switzerland and uh, also Germany and, and the GPS system when you would enter or the, yeah, the system on the car, when you'd enter a new country, it would tell you something about the symbols, it would tell you the speed limits and you know what to watch out for because in some cases that could relate to safety or life and death kind of issues, just not knowing the symbols. And again, depending on, on the world that we're talking about, the domain, those are going to have very specific symbols, you know, Credit cards obviously are um, important to us, and those are, are symbols we recognize and we uh, understand probably in an immediate sense. Again, pointing to this idea that the symbol points beyond itself. So if we look at the etymology of, of symbol, you see that going back to the 1500s or 15th century, or other 1400s, uh, a creed, religious belief, um, a token, a mark. You can think of how early symbols and indeed early brands developed in economic systems. 
Um, so coins, obviously, if those coins had a particular stamp that meant something, it could have a denomination. It also maybe meant that you couldn't recreate that yourself. And in today's day and age, with uh, currency and maybe everything moving to the chip system, coming up with our credit cards, um, you know, the point is not necessarily just marking something off as a denomination, but trying to prevent piracy. Because uh, in the eight day and age of copying and stuff, you know, someone with a color printer, right, in the old days could maybe fairly effectively, with a little bit of work, um, you know, create a knockoff dollar, not a dollar bill, but a ten dollar bill or something like this, potentially. Uh, but in today's day and age, you know, they're embedding um, all kinds of security devices, uh, maybe even chips or special ink, things that allow you to detect if the thing is real or not. Um, the same thing with branding, when we talk about brands today, Early, uh, the earliest brands, literally, right, were taking a branding iron and making sure that you could identify your cattle or your livestock from the other livestock out there. So I think the fact that a lot of this goes back to maybe economic context is important, and also, again, the religious um, context as well. So both of those, I think, are equally important. Um, what, you know, you get some of the other meanings, throwing something together, you know, like, uh, casting something, uh, the stroke of a missile, a bolt, or a beam, that also gives you that sense of symbols as having a public property to them, a public importance. And also the idea of throwing something suggests that there's going to be meaning attached to it. It's going to have maybe a dramatic effect on us. So a symbol, I think, um, can never be taken lightly. It, it has that ability to, as we'll talk about later with Victor Turner's work, to instigate social action, to get us to think about something in emotional senses. Uh, you can actually look online. There are quite a few good sources that, that show you all the different symbols out there. Symbols.com is one of the sites that has thousands of different symbols, categorized in, in many different ways. Um, this, this other uh, version of the Dictionary of Symbols gets into much more specific meanings. and gets you into the history of you know, um, why a bat has certain symbolic properties. And some of these, as I'll show later, have um, connections to do dream analysis, if any of you do dream analysis. That's kind of a fun way to look at symbols. That takes us back a little bit to Carl Jung's work on the archetype and the collective unconscious. It's like, if you dream about a bat, what does that mean? And it has different meanings, you try to analyze it. And again, in a dream, what's kind of cool about doing dream analysis is you discover that there could be a lot of meanings attached to something very simple or something <coughs> uncanny or very odd in your dream. And then by doing dream analysis, you can maybe come to a better understanding of those multiple meanings of that particular symbol. So this is an example in the Dictionary of Symbols of trying to take a symbol and, and break it down and understand in different cultures what it means. I think they mentioned here that, um, I don't know if it's with the bat, there were a few others I was looking at that said, in one culture it means one thing, in another culture it means another. And it's kind of tricky, like with color analysis, like the whole thing about wearing white to the wedding versus wearing red, you know, those could have different meanings in different cultures. Maybe in one culture it means life, just to talk about like the swastika, and another culture it means death. And so it could be an offense to people if you wear that color or show that symbol, or I think I have up here, you know, doing this in some cultures could mean, you know, fuck you, right, versus hey, it's A-OK. -okay. So I think it's really important to know the different meanings, particularly if you're traveling, so you don't offend people in other cultures. I read in the book last night that we're one of the only countries that wears black as like a form of sorrow. Yeah. Like when you go to funerals, like everyone wears black, but mm -hmm. now there's like so many other countries, it's always like white, right. or like red or green. Yeah. And that's why it's really hard. Um, for one of the books I was writing about, you know, color symbolism, I was trying to, you know, give the reader some advice about, well, here's what this color means, and here's some potentials. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't really get universal about it because uh, yellow in one culture means one thing, it means something else in another culture. So I think it's really hard, like if you're a designer and you're even thinking about color, if you get into you know, feng shui stuff where you're trying to think about the um, orientation of objects in the room, you go back to that same question about what's appropriate for one culture is inappropriate for another one. And that's one of the challenges, I think, of globalization, living in the consumer culture when we get into designing spaces um, you know, a very famous one, the MGM um, Casino in Las Vegas used to be the lion, uh, and then, you know, or it still is a lion, but you would walk through the lion, and the discovery was that this was considered unlucky for many Asian gamblers. And because a lot of the, you know, high rollers maybe come from Asian cultures, they said, well, we should change the entrance. And it's always a challenge, I think, with any form of design, or even, you know, a movie, or something that's gonna have very evocative colors or symbols, 
or design elements, when you discover that one culture may be offended by that particular symbolism. And again, it gets really challenging, because then I, I think that maybe you can't have a universal approach to something because you're never going to take into account all the cultural and religious diversity out there. So I think it's a really good point when you get into color symbolism. Again, this is the um, symbols.com. Um, if you want to check it out, you can, you know, alchemical symbols, blueprint symbols, Chinese symbols, computer symbols, emblems, flags. Probably just in flags, you could have hundreds, if not thousands of variations. Over time, flags change. Obviously, the US flag has changed over time. Many other uh, countries, their flags change. Uh, zodiac symbols. And what's cool about this is it gives you just the very basic um, discussion of what something is. And then you could, if you wanted to, do some additional research and try to understand why a symbol is the way it is and why it changes over time as well. So that's a great site if you want to look at more of this in depth. Now, I was mentioning the work of Charles Hockett. Uh, if you want to look this up, just Google Charles Hockett, Design Features of Language. Um, some of these could apply to non-human animals, but when you get into things like displacement, arbitrariness, discreteness, you know, this is where it tends to be uniquely human. And it's not to say that humans are superior. In fact, if anything, I think when you see the swastika uh, and the complexity of, of our symboling system and how that ties back to culture and warfare and genocide and violence, you could say, if anything, it makes us lower animals in terms of our propensity for doing massive amounts of damage to one another. But the point about this is to say that there's more complex um, signing systems or symboling systems. And as a result, it suggests that our language is a little bit different than the language of, of animals. And displacement, I think, is one of the key ones. Um, there are some studies with primates that suggest perhaps they can start to do things like put together. One of these is, um, which one? Not arbitrariness, total feedback, discreteness, pro productivity. Um, you, you know, one of these gets into this idea that you can build over time on language. So even though the technology changes, we don't have to develop an entirely new language for that, right? We can adapt our current language. Well, like if you have a dog or a cat and you want them to do that, right? You know, maybe they can't if you bring in a new object into your house or something like this. They could have a response to it. They could sniff it. They could wag their tail. If they're a cat, they might start, start purring. But they're maybe not going to have the ability to develop an entirely new sign based on that new thing that you introduce into your household. Now, there was a study years ago of um, a famous chimp that learned sign language. And then there was a, a moment where one of the trainers said, oh, you know, they, they took away the chimp's food. And the chimp then said, OK, I, you know, the chimp basically put together two signs. And it was like the sign for um, dirty and um, some kind of fruit, I think it was. And then the trainers inferred that because of this, it was an insult, that they were basically, the chimp was insulting the trainers by combining these two signs. Now, that's a possibility. The other possibility is that the trainers were inferring something about the language. Now, there are very complex um, sign systems and symbol systems of, obviously, like whales, um, many animals out there, right? incredible complexity. Um, elephants is an interesting one in terms of what elephants can communicate, and even the notion of um, uh, elephant graveyards and this idea that, you know, how they uh, deal with death and grief and so forth. It's not to say it doesn't happen, but again, when you get into the really complex things like displacement, it would be very hard for a cat or dog or goldfish to refer to something that happened over time. There could be maybe a, a, a Pavlovian response if they remembered something over time about a particular thing they do and they get a treat for that. But do they remember the specific instance of them getting a treat or an activity that happened on October 10th, 2015, right? Humans have that ability because of displacement, productivity, arbitrariness, and some of these other features that um, Hawkins talked about. So the idea is that because of this, um, over time, we can develop incredibly complex forms of symbols, such as the swastika, where we can't even necessarily decide on all of its meanings or determine all of its meanings. We can also talk about metaphor, a very important book by uh, Lakoff and Johnson called Metaphors We Live By. And this gets into other realms of, and this is very expansive. You can start to talk about signs, and signs include everything. They include symbols, but they also include very simple things. So like an animal, um, if an animal is in heat or something like this, if there's mating in, in nature, those could be sign systems that have a very limited communication. It's for this purpose, like where there's smoke, there's fire kind of thing. The signs also include very complex things like symbols, um, metaphors, 
are something you probably study in, in lit crit, in uh, English classes. Um, a metaphor is just anything that stands for something else. So one thing from one domain is made to have meaning in another domain. And you can see all the examples here of the metaphors that Lakoff and Johnson talk about. Ideas that, uh, you know, um, let me hear your two cents worth. Or, um, you know, this person is a machine or something like this, if they're really athletic or they're a really strong worker. So why is it that we, as humans create metaphors, what do they mean for us? And Lankoff and Johnson says that metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in action and thought. Our ordinary conceptual system in terms of uh, which we both think and act is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. And so I think this is key because sometimes what happens is we allow our metaphors to invade our consciousness. And one of these they talk about in the book is about warfare. And so if we start to say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, the minute I need them, right, I can't think of them. Can you think of any metaphors that use war um, as an, an example if you're trying to make a decision or something like this? You don't say, let's conquer this. What are you saying? I'm trying to think. I just, I'm drawing a blank. Metaphors for war in everyday life that we use. Over the top. Over the top, okay. Yeah. That's one. Um, yeah, anything that would suggest, like, conquering something as opposed to coming to cooperation on something? Dictate. Dictate, okay. Yeah, that could be another one, like, like yeah, dictator. Um, so anything like that might suggest to us that maybe we have to take a step back and analyze our language and say, should we have a better way, instead of using warfare to communicate stuff in everyday life, can we communicate in a different way? The suggestion is that if we do that, right, then we change our approach, right? So if we're using the, the metaphors of war, uh, particularly like in the business world, the suggestion is change those and then you, you would have a different approach because the, the thought is that our language, our symbols under, undergird our actions. So all this kind of stuff then, the idea would be that relates to our relates action and leaps. And I think any time in a, in, a, in a time of war, you have to uh, think about this. So one of the things I'm doing for the debate is I made some word clouds. Um, I took, you know, different party platforms of the GOP and the Democrats, and I also took, uh, you know, from diff different Democratic debates, they have word cloud generators, you just plug in the words, and it does a simple thing, it just counts how many times they say one word versus another, and then it blows the words up based on that. And I think it's kind of curious that in different eras, the different political parties were talking about things like war, talking, talking about things like work, um, based on that, the hot issues of the time. And I think one of the things that comes up, like if you look at a guy like Donald Trump versus Bernie Sanders, um, you know, he's gonna use different language to incite people, right? If you say something about immigrants, right, that has, for some people, a lot of connotations, different connotations, and people have accused Trump of using code words of the white nationalist movement, and NPR just did a interesting long study of this. Uh, you could go on the web and listen to interviews, basically saying that, He's deliberately doing this. And then when someone asked him, well, Mr. Trump, you know, why are you popular with the white nationalist movement? Uh, he said, well, I'm popular with everybody. So in his mind, he didn't care about this. He didn't care about the symbols that he was using, maybe inciting people, particular people, those words having connotations, hidden connotations. Um, I think I have on this PowerPoint, maybe it's the other PowerPoint, but I was over the weekend for my other class, I was looking at uh, the uh, European uh, soccer leagues produced a guide for people for all the different symbols that could be associated with hate. Because if you know, there's a lot of um, nationalism that happens with soccer, with football all over, all over the world. Some of it's very blatant racism, some of it's more just like nationalistic, like we love our team, we love our country. Again, the lines like with the swastika are not always easy to draw. But I started looking through this guide and it was like 60 pages long, and I couldn't believe it for every culture. Well, of course I could believe it, but I was like, wow, you know, Croatia. And it had numbers, and certain numbers could have, you know, um, Nazi associations or different symbols, as, as both of you talked about the swastika. But they were beyond the swastika, and I thought, wow, if I saw some of those, I wouldn't know. So, I mean, it's, it really, I think, is important sometimes to say, okay, what are the symbols, what are the metaphors, what are the signs, and what does it say about us, and how can we change the meanings in some cases, or be more aware of the meanings. And again, the point about education, I think, is really key. Um, again, they talk about conceptual metaphors. You know, any time we, we talk about argument being warfare, that shaping how we view something, oh, this is a very simple one. He won that argument, right? Winning and losing. Or I attacked every weak point in his argument. 
This happens in our um, court system, our judicial system, where you go into a court, if you, if the language that lawyers, attorneys, prosecutors, defendants use, very um, hyperbolic, very emotional, often trying to get the jury to uh, make a decision or, or, or take a decision based on something very emotional, not based on, excuse me, something that's factual or something that's based on um, rationality. And as a result, I think it, it challenges us to think about the language that is being used at e any given point in time. Again, if you watch the debate tomorrow night, think about that. Um, if you watch the news tonight, think about the language that's being used, the metaphors that are being deployed, and should we maybe use different language? And I think it's very important, even if you go into like social work or a field where you have to deal with complex issues of a very personal nature, um, emotional kinds of issues, you might think about this because again, if you're using a particular language and if you're prejudging your client or prejudging the, the individuals you're working with, just by using the wrong language, that gets um, very tricky. So it just uh, maybe the, the point is to get us to think about the language that we use before we, we use it. Now I won't go into too much depth there, pretty complex stuff, but I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of theories out there of in individuals who talk about, again, signs or symbols or metaphors. Um, Ferdinand so a very important individual who wanted to talk about language and specifically said the nature of language is arbitrary. And this may sound um, kind of commonsensical, but I don't think it really is because there are some theorists out there. There's a theorist who is looking at this idea of um, universal language and saying that all the languages of the world develop from one core system. So that if you look at all the words for water in the different languages, there is some similarity, suggesting like Carl Jung and the archetypes, that actually there's a universal reason, there's even a sound reason if we use the word water in some languages, and I don't know if in English it works, it would suggest uh, like onomatopoeia, the flowing of something. Like um, cock-a-doodle-doo is an example of onomatopoeia, of a word that tries to almost like a hieroglyph, you know, hieroglyph could represent um, something in the world in a, in a more literal sense or representational sense. Onomatopoeia is the same thing. So some people argue that all the words in the different languages for water sound maybe like the flowing of water. And I don't personally think, I, I, I don't, I'm not a you know, believer in, in that theory per se, but it's an interesting theory. I tend to think more in the, the realm of so sort of that you know, language is arbitrary. So if we use Hund in German, if we use dog in English and all the other variations for what we consider to be a dog, there's no particular reason, natural reason, um, you know, embedded in nature, or embedded in um, like cosmological systems that is why we call something a dog versus some other word for that. There are just arbitrary uh, bits of um, meaning and sound phonemes and morphemes that we combine together and they have meaning for us. And so, so, so Sir was interested in looking at how you know, we make mental pictures in our head about any particular word or, or concept or symbol out there. Um, Again, I won't go in, into that in, in too much depth, but basically it talks about the signifier and the signified, and this is how we make meaning of the world. But he basically says it's arbitrary. There is no natural reason that we call something a dog or something a cat. Um, it's basically part of culture and the fact that we have complex ways to represent our world in terms of signs, in terms of uh, in, in terms of, of meaning. So here's the uh, conspiracy symbols, and, and you stole my example, but it, it, again, it's so um, it's, it's so prevalent, right? And I think conspiracy symbols are kind of fun because it allows people to take something that is very prevalent and pervasive. So you know, again, this is on all of our money, and it's everywhere else in culture and then to run with it, basically. And this shows you the value, I think, of those symbols and metaphors and signs is that they're going to incite uh, people to question things, hopefully to educate themselves, as, as many of you talked about, but might also result in some very negative things. Because I think if you got too wrapped up in Masonic symbols or the symbols of the Illuminati and so forth, uh, you know, and again, you could run with this, right? I found this, I was just Googling stuff, and they said, okay, actually, these company lo logos are pagan Masonic symbols, and indeed they might be. And that could just be like, hey, you know, these are evocative symb symbols, the pentagram, it's something that has gone back, as many of you pointed out, with some of your symbols, thousands of years in many cultures. If I'm a branding expert, and I'll talk about some of this later with um, 
some of the new work on brands, you know, Love Marks is one in particular. And if you go through and you look at all the symbols uh, that are part, or logos as we call them, of any company, you're going to find very evocative ones. The Nike symbol, just looking through here, you know, all the different ones possibly. In some cases, you choose something, maybe because it's going to be very identifiable, like the symbol of the Red Cross. If someone needs help, they know where to get it. Again, if it's a brand, if you're buying a particular shoe, um, that might be the first thing your eye goes to. So, uh, your eye goes to. So it's not going to be surprising if some of these are ancient symbols or symbols that are particularly evocative and universal. Because if you're trying to sell a product, you don't maybe want a symbol that's too complex for people to represent. Like I was saying with the swastika, if I can't remember which way or how to draw it myself, that's maybe a sign that if you were trying to develop. Um, a brand symbol, a logo, you may want to go with something simpler because it's just um, for the purpose in a lot of cases to get recognition, just like that notion of uh, branding cattle so you know which you know which farmer goes with which cows or whatever. It's the same thing with brands and logos. They have to be very identifiable. So it may not be that there's actually a, a conspiracy going on to take over the world, all of the, the you know, Illuminati and one world government or whatever people are, people are talking about. But there could be other explanations for that as well. Um, but I think we're at break, so let's take our, um, spend two days on, on symbols because it's a fairly significant, important uh, concept in anthropology. Now, when we talk about conspiracy symbols or conspiracy theories that relate to the various popular symbols out there, it seems to me that it's an excellent way to see um, the various properties of symbols. So we can talk about their social and public significance. Again, uh, the swastika, I think, is an example of a symbol that's going to incite discussion Hopefully, as many of you said, inside also education. Victor Turner, someone I'll be talking about, wrote a very famous book called The Forest of Symbols. And he studied a group called the Ndebu. And he was very interested in symbols and their various uses and rituals and so forth. And a key quote of his was that symbols instigate social action. So they're not just sort of these static things that are out there, examples of language. They actually incite violence. They incite people to do things. If you think about the controversy related to um, the Charlie Hebdo in France, these you know terrorists that killed I don't know, seven to ten people in the um, office of the satirical newspaper, who were you know doing what was considered um, forms of um, blasphemy of taking uh, Muhammad and, and you know making cartoons and so forth. I think it's an example of, of this very point about symbols instigating social action. So unfortunately, certain symbols then will um, cause people to respond in various ways. And it gets, it gets, I think, quite frightening to think about how something, I don't want to say as simple as a symbol, because symbols are complex. But at the surface, you could say, if you go back to the source point, we could have chosen any possible representation of God, or Allah, or Muhammad, or you know, thinking about any re religious um, terms or foundations. Same thing with symbols, right? We could have chosen all sorts of different arbitrary um, symboling systems or particular representations of something. But the fact that they incite people to commit violent acts, to do things that are very antisocial, and so forth, suggests Turner's point uh, exactly. Now, they have multiple and often elusive meanings. So again, if you said to me, what's the meaning of the swastika? Well, that's impossible to answer. I would say there are multiple meanings, as both of you pointed out. Same thing with a controversial like flag, like the Confederate flag. I would say there are different meanings. Those meanings change over time. Um, in a democratic society, hopefully we can agree on the terms of the debate, what will be presented in public, um, how it will be presented. But um, I would hate to be the one, the people on the board deciding something like this. Because I, I just think it would be so messy, right, to get into the, I have my personal views, like I think a lot of the uh, sports mascots are incredibly offensive and they shouldn't be used. Now, the very you know pro uh, free speech people will say no no you defend everything even if it's very aberrant. Well, I would say but there are other things we could spend our time on right. Uh, if, if a lot of people are offended, if Native Americans are offended by a particular mascot, guess what? Mascots change all the time. I was on the committee here a couple of years ago. I was a joke about it because I took it very seriously and I was like, well, here's what the coyote means, and you could talk about you know totemic systems and. Cultures and I think people wanted that. You know, it seemed like the coyote people really wanted this as opposed to the salmon and the kokanee, which is fine. But the point is, we we can have a committee and we could say, what's the new team name of the uh, Redskins going to be, and what's the new logo going to be, and the new mascot. It's not a big deal. It's, in fact, sports teams have done this all the time. Um, the Washington Bullets, right? Most people don't remember this. If you're kind of young, you remember the Washington Bullets, but they used to be the Bullets. People thought bullets are kind of negative. 
you know, DC, you know, gangs and shootings. So we change it right to the uh, Wizards. And same thing with other teams. You know, this happens all the time. And I think a lot of people say it's about political correctness, but I think it's about being critical about symbols, about names, about representations, and as a community, making some new decisions. We could easily change some of these things, but again, a lot of the meanings are personal to people, and as a result of this, you know, it's um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's too hard to change some of these. There was one over the weekend I found. Um, I think maybe it's it's on my PowerPoint again. <laughs> I was doing two PowerPoints this weekend, so it could be on my my second class PowerPoint. But it's it's a uh, symbol uh, of like. Um, it's not Albany, but it's, it's a small town out in, in northern New York State. And uh, it's a symbol of a, like a pilgrim, a, a white guy choking an indigenous person. And I was shocked to see this. Still there, I'm like, wow, this is you know Columbus Day as we talk about some of these issues today. I, I was kind of shocked to see this, but also not shocked because it occurs to me that a lot of times we, we've had these, this deep, bitter, racist history, ethnocentric history, and it's hard for, for people to change sometimes. Often, again, there's a lot of um, open-endedness to these symbols. So I was just Googling some of this. Again, uh, Jeezy talk, talked about a little bit of this as well. Conspiracy symbols, you know, if you see 666, some of this gets quite dramatic. Like, I, I remember when I was uh, in high school, people were obsessed with playing, we had records back then, and they were obsessed with playing their records backwards, you know, like, oh, if you play this record backwards, it's going to have some satanic, you know, stairway to heaven, right? And indeed, you know, some of it has backward masking, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're trying to, I don't know, get people to convert to Satanism or something like this. But again, the conspiracy theories are fun and they're pro pro prolific, you know, all the all-seeing eye and so forth, and it, it, it has very charged meanings. Uh, this was kind of interesting with the wing games. I don't know if you saw this one. So this happened after 9-11. Well, they looked at the Microsoft wing, web dings or wing dings, which I always thought are, are really annoying as hell. So my whole association with this stuff, like emojis, it's like, I find it annoying. You know, like Comic Sans to me, that font symbolizes like just scratching, we don't have chalkboards anymore, but you know, the most annoying kind of thing. So when I see this stuff, I, I just find it kind of annoying because I, I think that it's a simplification of things. It's almost like a cartoon version of language. Well. Of course, people say if you uh, do things like analyze uh, September 11th, and if you do New York City and Webdings, it's this. And then so people start to come up with these conspiracy theories saying that, well, there was some conspiracy rooted in Microsoft's Webdings or Wingdings, and as a result of this, you know, that says something that 9-11 was an inside job or something like this. I didn't put the text in here, but people analyzed this and said, you know, it just so happened that those symbols were chosen for particular letters. Again, if you're being very selective and going back after the fact and trying to hunt for things and find things, you can find any meaning you want in anything. And that's why I've always been kind of the, uh, you know, say anti, but with Nostradamus, you know, if you look at any of the Nostradamus stuff, it's kind of fun, I remember in uh, elementary, in our grades, uh, middle school and high school, people were way into Nostradamus when I was growing up. But, the funny thing about Nostradamus is a lot of those quatrains are so generic. You know, if they say a fire came from the sky, okay, you know, how many events have happened where there's an explosion? Well, a lot of events, right? So you can go back in time and say Nostradamus predicted 9-11 or Nostradamus predicted the atomic explosion because all of those are, are fires that happen in the sky, unfortunately. Um, the same thing with, I was talking with someone last night about um, psychics and people who do uh, some of the uh, ghost channeling stuff, John Edward, that show Crossing Over. If you look at some of the techniques there, John Edward, and if he had a big audience of 100 or so people, he would start with something like, I'm, I'm seeing something about a dog. How many people have a dog? And of course, you know, like half the audience or more raises their hands because a lot of people have dogs, a lot of people have pets. And then he breaks it down a little more, and then he'll start talking about how he sees the color blue. Well, the color blue is common. If you have you're wearing blue or something like this, right? Oh, okay, well, there's significance for me because, you know, I'm wearing blue. Um, so one of the points is that with selective interpretation, you can come up with any meaning that you want for just about anything. So conspiracy theories, I think, are fun, but maybe to place a lot of time in some of these things, we could place time in other things. Like, if you really think the government um, needs to improve, probably the better way is, is to spend your time voting and being involved in political action as opposed to maybe spending hours and hours trying to find all the hidden messages in web dings or weavings. I don't know. Maybe there are some hidden messages there. Again, we could 
talk about this, but um, is it the best uh, use of our time? Maybe not. Now, Victor Turner, again, a very important book, The Forest of Symbols, uh, wrote about how symbols and ritual were interconnected. He um, came up with a, a series of, of important points. And by the way, these are all related here on your handout. And this is something that's not in the book, just for the fact that you know they maybe weren't as influenced by Victor Turner as I was. One of my, actually my first Stanford teacher was a student of Victor Turner, so it was kind of like um, inculcated in us as students in, those, in these anthro classes to learn about Victor Turner. And his work has always stuck with me over time because I think there's a lot of meaning there that can be applied today, a lot of analysis and frameworks, analytical frameworks that can be applied to symbols in contemporary culture, still relevant, regardless of, of the cultural context, still very relevant theories. So he talks about ritual as being um, you know, a form of formal behavior for occasions that are not given over to technological routine and have reference to beliefs and mystical beings and powers. What he says, though, is that the smallest unit of any ritual is a symbol. And so he sees that there's a, a key connection between rituals and symbols. And he says that the smallest unit of any rit ritual that still retains the properties of that religion or of that ritual is what we call a symbol. In a sense, it's like a battery. It's a storage unit. It stores information. It stores thoughts. It stores metaphors. It stores ideas. It even stores actions. And then that then gets deployed in various cultural contexts. Again, in good and bad ways, as we talked about with the swastika as a very evocative example of, of a symbol. Symbols can be objects, activities, words, relationships, events, gestures, or spatial units. Turner's definition of ritual refers to ritual performances involving the manipulation of symbols that refer to religious and religious beliefs. So if you look at um, here, uh, you know, the uh, Catholic Church here, or is it just general Christianity? I guess it's the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, you have certain signs and symbols. And this is just taken from the Catholic website. So you see a lot of times that these get used almost in this uh, pedagogical way to teach people, maybe young people, to say, here's what water means, here's what laying on hands means, here's what wine means, and so forth. So kind of going with Turner's notions, uh, you know, these would be the important units of the ritual, and then there are various rituals that happen, right, in Christian uh, context and Catholic context, and you're always using these symbols. You might be using new versions of them or new interpretations of them, but you're typically using these. Um, you know, Allison talked about the uh, white and colors again. In particular contexts, you know, this could mean purity. In other contexts, it could mean something totally different. So it shows you that it's very specific to that culture, to that ritual, to that religion. Again, symbols and skin, social action. Um, if you look at a symbol here, you could say that you know symbols are something that connote um, relationships, events, gestures, spatial units in rituals. They're also very important in a dynamic sense. And so if we think about the controversy related to the Confederate flag, Walmart pulled selling of the Confederate flag in all the stores and online and so forth, there was enough, I guess, social impetus to say, we no longer think it's OK to sell the Confederate flag. Now, flags are very evocative. And whenever I use uh, Turner's concept of symbols and skating, social action, I think back to this uh, piece here uh, from the Art Institute of Chicago by a, a socialist artist, Dred Scott. At the time, he was calling himself Dred Scott Tyler. And his piece was, what is the proper way to display uh, the American flag or US flag? And so this piece then had um, a book where you could write comments, and it had some, some uh, graphic stuff here, you know, uh, the flag being draped on coffins. And they had the flag on the ground. And so what happened was this was displayed. And again, he was a student at the time when he uh, created this artwork back in, it was the uh, 90s, I think, late 80s, early 90s was when this happened. So kind of very you know, dated now. But his concept then was that people could um, you know, walk on the flag if they wanted to and write comments on the book. And this itself incited, you know, I don't want to say a riot, but a lot of veterans were upset. They said, this is uh, you know, degrading, you're taking the flag, there are appropriate ways to display the flag. But again, this is what he was trying to do. I think he was trying to instigate social action, right? He was an artist, and he was trying to, he still is an artist, he was trying to get people to take a position on this. Um, when uh, you can see here, you know, this even national uh, debate about this, uh, you know, banning the flag, we, sh we should not do this. So it became very much um, a form of, of um, 
outrage for some people. For other people, it was about free speech. And again, that shows you the two sides of any important symbol. Now, talking to some artist friends at the time, a lot of them said, you know, it's kind of just like if you do an all white painting, you know, a lot of people did. It was a Jasper Johns, I'm trying to remember. Jasper Johns, I think, did some versions of flag too. If you, if you do something involving the American flag, if you do something involving maybe something very dramatic, uh, the artist uh, Chris Ophelia did something with the Virgin Mary painted with, with dung, with you know, a fecal matter. Again, that's going to incite a lot of um, action for people because people are going to say, hey, you're degrading the Virgin Mary by painting it with you know, um, crap, right? I mean, <laughs> defecation, whatever you call that, excrement. Same thing with the flag, um, representation of the flag. And a lot of artists actually say, because it's too charged symbolically, all the white paintings that have been done or all the flag uh, desecration works that have been done, you're not as talented as an artist maybe because you're, you're choosing something that's easy. Now again, I don't want to take a position on that because who am I to say that someone could come up with a new version of flag art that gets us thinking about something uh, in an entirely different way. And in fact, I would say you could say it's equally challenging or equally easy, depending on your perspective and what you're doing as an artist, to t take something as evocative and as you known. Know, well, as so it uh, you know, enrages some people. Other people say, this is great. And I actually heard in college, Dred Scott Tyler came to where I was an undergrad student at Indiana University and gave a big talk. And it was packed, and people were, there was security there and stuff. And, he was very, uh, you know, he was talking about his art and his political beliefs, very socialist, radical individual. And, you know, to me it sounded like he was doing this artwork and this was his vision of what it meant to, uh, you know, think about the American flag. Because as an African American person, as someone who probably de dealt with police brutality, he was thinking about it in a much different day. Just like, in a much different day. Just like on uh, Columbus Day, if you're an indigenous person, you might think, oh, for me, Columbus Day means oppression of my particular people versus another person who thinks, oh, is that good dude? I, I remember when I was a kid, you know, they had this dressing up as pilgrims and Indians. How are we going to do this today? And we have like a, you know, a little festival around, you know, Thanksgiving, kind of that same thing where you're celebrating someone like Columbus or celebrating that. In today's day and age, probably those meanings have changed over time. But again, flag art, I think, is very um, interesting because it gets you to think about um, what exactly the symbol means and what are the, the, the context of the symbol and so forth. Um, and I was looking some of this up and it shows you here, uh, here's how you display an American flag and here's how you hang it this way and not to hang it. Um, you know, there are particular rituals that uh, take place if you dispose of a flag. It's very um, intricate as you can see here. Proper to, to, proper to fly the stars and stripes at night, but only if it's spotlighted, okay? <laughs> interesting stuff, you know? Very, very intricate if you look, at, look into uh, flag etiquette. Now, I thought I'd show you here, I think I have a little clip. Um, we're going to come back to this film when we do our section on mana, and we're not going to watch the whole film then, so I thought I would show you the short clip about flags because I find it very curious. It's just about four or five minutes that shows you something. Do you think it's weird that people would want one of those flags? I don't know. A little bit. I, mean, I guess it, you know, it's, it's the meaning of a symbol, right, that matters. And so for some people, maybe being able to say, and this is what, where we get into this idea of mana, which again we're going to talk about. So mana certainly is about symbols, but it's also about something having a charge to it. And if you bring in an object when we talk about mana that has meaning for you, it could be that it has meaning because it, of its age, where it was, what happened to you, an event, when you, when you have this object. So maybe for some people, the, the idea of having a flag flown over the Capitol, even if it's just, it's not even a minute, right? Maybe it seems silly to some of us, but again, that emic level of understanding would say, for some people, it has significance because it still flew over the Capitol, albeit for just a very, very short time. So we'll come back to that, certainly, when we talk about um, the idea of Bono later in quarter. Now, to get back to Turner's uh, notion, I have this all in here as well. Um, he talks about dominant and instrumental symbols and says dominant symbols would be something that has meaning throughout the entirety of uh, a ritual uh, of a particular religion. So maybe the cross, the crucifix, and a lot of 
uh, Christian traditions. And then you could think of you know, the, the chalice as the more instrumental symbol that accomplishes more specific goals of the particular religion or ritual. So dominant is like carries throughout the ritual, throughout the religion, instrumental gets used. It's part of the same system. So this is always going to relate back to this. But the idea is that like this is the bigger symbol, the more dominant, and the instrumental gets played out in more minute uh, senses within a particular ritual. Now, Turner talks about the properties of symbol, and these are all important, and also go back to some of Hockett's uh, ideas about symbols. So one thing is that symbols um, condense. They represent different things and different actions in one form. So condensation is this idea of saying that your symbol is an, a one-stop shop, right? It does a lot of things in a very simple form. Um, also, this idea of unification of disparate significata, and kind of a mouthful there, just means different signs are unified together. So different things then, different layers of meaning of the symbol are interconnected <coughs> by having common qualities. Could be color properties, could be shapes, as when we talked about the swastika, could be um, different properties of particular symbol, those meanings are all united in one form. There's also polarization of meaning, so that means you could have um, different, there's actually two uh, poles here, one's the ideological, one is the sensory. So basically all symbols will have something that is sensory about it that will get us to think about it. Maybe it's um, in uh, a lot of you know, rituals, it could be something about the, you know, the blood of Christ, the red blood or something. It gets us to think about it, it has an empirical effect on us, it's sensory. The ideological is happening at the level of values, happening at the level of thought, such that you say, what does the blood of Christ mean to you as a Christian? So it gets you to think at two levels, there's polar meanings, there's two levels of meaning, the normative or ideological and the sensory. Um, now, Turner says, how can you understand symbols? He says, well, there are a lot of different ways to approach the meanings of symbols. One is exegesis. And all of you did that in your presentation today. So basically, exegesis, we talked about exegesis of the Bible. It just means giving us all the meanings and interpretations possible for a text or for a symbol. So if I want to do exegesis and get the exegetical meaning of something, I would say, okay, here's what the Starbucks you know, symbol or logo means, and I'll give you all the meanings of that. As Turner is saying, we should do all of these, but some of these may have more important values to you as the anthropologist, depending on what you're trying to understand about the symbol, about the ritual, the religious system, and, and its culture. The other would be the operational meaning, and this would be how is a symbol being used in a particular context? And I think some of this gets controversial because it, for both the operational meaning and the positional meaning, he's saying there is less and less that the indigenous person or the emic individual, the insider for that ritual, for that symbol, will know. So you get a playing off of the etic and the emic, and the question becomes like, who knows? In some cases, Turner believes at least, again, we could disagree with this, that only the anthropologist would know. The positional meaning talks about how one symbol works in tandem with another symbol in a ritual context. And Turner believes, that, again, it starts to sound maybe a little elitist, that sometimes the actual practitioners of the symbols of the ritual of that religion wouldn't themselves be aware of those meanings. And thus, it's about the anthropologist coming to terms of understanding all of those meanings and kind of piecing together the puzzle as it plays out in the particular ritual and so forth. Now, I would say, again, I was thinking of, you know, dream symbols are kind of a fun way to think about symbols and how they mean different things. And often when we talk about dream symbols, like if someone meets with their therapist and talks about the meaning of a particular dream, it's going to have a very personal meaning. And in some cases, that meaning could relate to other meanings that other people have, but in some cases it could be entirely different. So, for example, if you dream about a baby or dream about a particular animal, if it's a vicious animal, maybe that connotes fear or aggression or something like this, something you're struggling with, crosses, exams. Um, I always have this like recurring dream, even though I'm not a student. I always have a dream about, like, in the dream, I'm in college, and I'm taking a class, and I'm like late for the exam, you know? Or I get to the room, and it's like, oh, there's only 10 minutes left, right? So that could be like an anxiety thing. Like, it could symbolize something about me and time. It doesn't have the literal meaning that I'm taking exams, and again, in my past, I took a lot of exams as a student, but it could have a meaning to me played out in my contemporary life that also has a historic meaning, but it means something specific to me. And again, anxiety dreams or dreams that have you know symbols of being chased or something like this, maybe not with cartoon versions, could have very specific meanings for us depending on who we are 
And I think it's, you know, dreams, again, a lot of the work on dreams saying you know, dreams speak in a very symbolic language. Some people believe that this ties back to union interpretations of collective unconsciousness, that we somehow share um, our own, we have a shared reality out there, you know. Some people take Jung's work and, and extend it to this idea that we all participate in this same layer of a collective unconscious, and maybe we just can't tune into that, or we only tune into that in our dreams. Um, have any of you done any dream analysis in your own lives? Do you find it interesting to analyze? Do you analyze your dreams? Do you understand them? Yeah. What, do you have any views on your dreams? You try no, but I've read something about this one track. Like, I guess they took a great emphasis on dreams. And actually, I guess if there was like a dream where you had another, someone else from the tribe in the dream, and it was a bad dream, that you would actually have to confront that person and tell them they, they were in your dream. Mm, wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, and that's an interesting thing. Like, what if your dreams impact? your everyday life, right? The action you that you take. Again, if you're a very paranoid person, it could have some maybe bad consequences, but there are certain cultures out there that um, might use dreams that they have to create artwork, to create songs. In Brazil, there's a particular group that, that does this. So dreams can can operate, you know, invoke the unconscious mind and then have a, you know, some, a role to play in everyday life. Allison. So this is like really, really, really strange, uh -huh. but like for like two or three years of my life, like I always had dreams that like my foot was being run over by a car. What? Like okay. always. No, wow. it was like so ridiculous. <laughs> and I would like come into play, like when I was like getting into cars too, like it would like come into my head, like I'm gonna get my foot run over. But it was just like subconscious, like really quick. Yeah. And I was like, okay, now that's ridiculous. But like sometimes at night, like it really did beat me up. And then like my friend and I, um, we found this website that like decodes dreams. Like I don't know if it's true, you never know, it's the internet. But it said that it could have something to do with like deficiencies in my joints and that like I have like Whoa. a calcium deficiency. Like yeah. it was like so oh weird. I was, like, wow. And like after I like looked into it, like I don't know, I just like, I was like, whatever, I'll try, you yeah. know, and like loaded up on a bunch of calcium and like I've never <laughs> had a dream since then about it. Oh. But sometimes I like yeah. think back on it and I'm like, that is so weird. Like yeah. of all things, like my foot being run over by a car, like in so many different like aspects. Like, did you ever find out? Like, did you have a calcium deficiency? Did you did you test that or something? Did you find well, that out? um, I don't eat milk or like, oh, okay. cheese or uh, oh, so eggs, like yeah, okay. anything like that. And so, like, um, I had mentioned it to a doctor just because, like, uh, I was right. curious. Yeah, yeah. I'm an athlete, so like, okay. I want to make sure that I have everything that I need. Yeah. And so, like, I did go and talk to a doctor, and you know, my doctor's like mad close. So we kind of just like we're joking <laughs> about it. Like, yeah. it's like so weird, you know. It's yeah. so funny, but like. Yeah, we were talking about it. She's like, no, you're healthy. Like, just make sure that you uh, get, like, everything that you need in, like, okay. the proper doses. Yeah. But you're fine. Like, she's like, if anything, I think you're okay now. I think you're more than okay. I don't need yeah. to worry about it yeah. anymore. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I think it is cool like, because it's, it, it's harmless, right? And if, you know, if you discovered, actually, that you did have a calcium deficiency, and if your dream prompted you to make that discovery, you know, what's wrong with that? Again, it's, it, it's perfectly so fine. Yeah. It, it is weird, but it's also, I mean, I think it's, it's also pretty interesting. And there are cultures where, you know, they have different methods of divination and oracles, and even when you get into plants, the symbolic properties of, of plants, like certain colors, it's kind of that same thing, that notion that basically maybe we're being told something from beyond. Um, so I'll very interesting, sorry. So I'll close on this, that <laughs> symbolic anthropology like that. is, yeah, no, it's super interesting. Symbolic anthropology, again, is an approach that says symbols have meanings. Um, we should analyze symbols. We should study our dreams. We should study brand symbols, as we're going to talk about in part two of this lecture um, in Wednesday's class. And there are important reasons that symbols exist. And again, if we look at the meaning of symbols and we do interpretation, we can learn so much about ourselves, whether it's studying dreams or studying the conspiracy theories in the back of dollar bills or whatever symbols exist in our culture. Um, so I'm going to close on that point today.